This video is the fourth of a series titled How to Release Pain and Suffering. And I'd like to suggest that you review the first three videos, 7a, b, and c, before going on to this fourth video, 7d. In this series, How to Release Pain and Suffering, I am trying to share some insights with the intent that they may bring you at least some relief in your times of hardship. My introspections are also meant to assist you in helping a loved one, friend or colleague should they ever incur a tragic situation. In this video I will first raise some points regarding the subjectivity of our pain and suffering and to further put our hardship into perspective, we'll turn from our own personal situation to considering the dilemmas of the vast majority of our 7 billion fellow world citizens, whose everyday existence in many cases consists of subsistence or mere survival. In the next video of this series, I'll be introducing foundations, NGOs, and superb individuals who, with the utmost commitment, determination, ingenuity, and dedication, are advancing human and civil rights, social justice, health, and the alleviation of hunger and poverty globally. It might help us to consider that pain and suffering are quite subjective. First, we may look at a hardship differently depending on the level of well-being in our current period of life. When we feel good and are well balanced and our life is going all right, and then we're all of a sudden exposed to a hardship situation, we may be able to deal with it quite effectively. Conversely, we may be going through a difficult period in our life. Our business may not be doing well and we're in a financial quandary. We may be experiencing a burnout. We may be going through a divorce. Or a parent may be seriously ill. In all those cases, one more misfortune has a much more severe impact and may just be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Same hardship situation, different in our response, depending on our prevailing level of well-being. Does it pay to make our well-being our top priority? Second, we all have a different frustration tolerance. I can see two reasons for that. A. People have different personalities. What constitutes suffering to one person may only be a nuisance or an inconvenience to another. The reason is that some people tend to be distrustful or pessimistic or they worry a lot. Others are more confident, cheerful or hopeful. It's the old story, glass half empty, glass half full. I have found that frustration is being released more and more through my practices of cultivating appreciation. B. Those people who have experienced a lot of hardship in their lives may be able to deal with the tragedy much better compared to people who were not exposed to suffering, perhaps because they lived a rather privileged, sheltered or even spoiled life. Again, same hardship situation, different subjective response, this time depending on the person. Of course, traumatic hardships can cause a person to become indifferent, desensitized or even callous. And that's not what I'm addressing here. Third, the subjectivity of suffering is also gender related. Normally, women tend to suffer emotionally more deeply than men, 
especially when their children or spouses are in jeopardy. However, in general, women have a greater tolerance for physical pain than men, perhaps because they are exposed to menstruation pain once a month that can be unbearable, and certainly because of labor pain during childbirth. So tell me, are women really the weaker gender? Fourth, the perception of suffering can also depend on age, and four examples come to mind. A. For instance, what appeared to be painful for us when we were a child may, in adulthood, be perceived by us as relatively harmless. B. On another thought, with age, sometimes comes wisdom, and an older person may consider that something much worse could have easily happened, is grateful that it didn't, and can therefore deal with a hardship much more easily than a younger person could. Wouldn't it be nice to be wise? C. In contrast, a younger person may accept a tragedy rather easily and look optimistically into the future, whereas an older person may be overwhelmed by the possible ramifications a hardship may bring. Perhaps we could learn from young people? D. I assume that children have a different perception of and seem to interpret pain and suffering in a more happy-go-lucky way than adults. For instance, family movies like Walt Disney's Bambi and television series of old like Lassie, Fury and Flipper featured problematic situations such as fights, accidents, separation and even loss. The fairy tales of the German Gebrüder Grimm and other storytellers are full of wicked witches, dangerous grandma-eating animals, and such inconceivably brutal acts as cutting off the thumbs with supersized scissors as punishment for thumb-licking. There you go. Although it is inexplicable to me how parents can permit their children to be exposed to some of these topics. I am absolutely amazed that children seem to have an unshakable belief in happy endings. Should we perhaps make children our role models? I hope that it helps you to evaluate how subjective pain and suffering can be. For this next section, I'd like to shift gears and take a look at how relative suffering is. From my studies of world regional geography, I am certain that hundreds of millions, if not billions of people on the face of this earth would gladly love to trade with us and gladly take on the hardship of our lives in exchange for theirs. Their everyday life is exceedingly difficult and filled with great suffering and pain. By the way, I'll talk about world regional geography at another time in more detail because it is one of the loves of my life. In the following, I am presenting some of the countless extreme everyday hardships many, many world inhabitants are continuously facing. Every day, about 40,000 humans on the face of this earth die of starvation and starvation-related diseases. That's about 40,000 people every day. And that's not counting extraordinary famines such as the current one in the Horn of Africa. Every minute, a woman in the developing world is dying either during her pregnancy, during childbirth, or shortly after labor, one every minute. Thousands of children are dying from the consequences of polluted drinking water every day. Two children per minute or 3,000 children per day are killed by malaria that's comparable to 80 fully loaded school buses plunging over a cliff 
every day. Is this making headline news? Every year, millions of children are dying from dehydration due to diarrhea. You may have heard that approximately one billion humans live on less than one dollar a day, and more than two billion people worldwide live on less than two dollars a day. Unimaginable compared to our spending habits. To quote Dave Ramsey, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Let's ask ourselves, can we really afford this lifestyle? The majority of humans live in poverty, have inadequate living accommodations and or suffer from the effects of severe illness. The majority of seven billion people that is. Many people are homeless or are displaced through war or civil strife. Many humans are illiterate or are lacking education, skill development or professional training and are therefore unable to escape the status of unskilled laborers and incapable of leaving behind once and for all poverty, hunger and despair. An estimated 1.5 billion people live entirely without electricity. That's every fourth or fifth world citizen. Innumerable innocent people are jailed and many are convicted and in some cases even sentenced to death without a trial. And just in comparison, 1% of humans own and use 40% of all goods and services. You and I are part of that 1%, a mere 70 million. This is only a fraction of the pain and suffering in the world. There are other severe inhuman adversities to which at least hundreds of millions of people globally are regularly exposed such as torture or other physical violence, assaults on women, children, the elderly, indigenous people and the dreadfully poor and destitute, sexual abuse, forced prostitution, FGM, female genital mutilation, we already talked about that, slave trade and slave labor, human trafficking and human abduction, racism, extortion, bribery and corruption, and political or religious persecution. In innumerable cases the perpetrators are not brought to justice because they are protected by immunity from prosecution by the ruling powers. Now tell me honestly does all this help you in putting your own hardship in perspective? Do you agree with me how relative pain and suffering are? If you'd like to add your own knowledge, observation or experience to my summary of human hardships globally, you can contact me by writing to cultivatingappreciation at gmail.com one word cultivating appreciation. I'd love to hear from you. As bleak and hopeless as these horrendous circumstances seem to be, it is encouraging to know that exceptional organizations and people exist, such as international activists and social entrepreneurs, who have for decades been working worldwide to alleviate the severe hardships for large segments of the population. Just as you may be helping a friend in need, they are creating a better world with the utmost commitment, determination, ingenuity and dedication. I will be introducing some of them in my next video. In particular, I will be featuring the tremendous work of some of the laureates of the Wright Livelihood Award, better known as the Alternate Nobel Prize, a foundation which was established by the German-Swedish 
Jakob von Uxel. Thank you for watching. Talk to you again real soon.